forest fam. <laughs> My nose looks big. Your nose, did you say your nose looks weird? Yeah. I'm glad that that's the first thing that everyone's going to hear on this call. <laughs> Keeping it real. Hello. Let's let everyone in. Hey everyone, this is Emma, but I'll introduce her in a second. There you go, got it. Let's hope I'm not. Em, when you were talking to me before, was my internet delayed at all? It didn't appear that way to me, no. Because mm -hmm. right, I'm waiting a really long time for my replies. <laughs> <laughs> I um am on the extension. I realize I'm like I'm in the kitchen. Oh, it's still working. So here we go, people. People are here. Look at these babes. <laughs> Tell me when I should scan my screen. Well, yeah, you can. Sh well, we can. We will we'll be able to see your face still, won't we, Em, if you share your screen? Uh, we should do. Is this a meeting or a webinar? This is a meeting, isn't it? It's a meeting. It should, though. We'll find out. <laughs> we'll try and you can tell me. Can't, <laughs> <laughs> like, let me know. I'm pretty sure, yeah, all participants. Yeah, yeah, we can, yeah, we can see you. I'm just going to put you on mute, Jen, even though I want to listen to those beautiful birds. <laughs> um, we'll just wait a few more minutes to get some more peeps in. But while we're waiting, this is my friend Emma. Hello. Emma and I used to co-work at when it was the co-work co and then it was path hunting and then she just went off and did amazing things. Uh, oh. oh. <laughs> okay. I'm losing a bit of... Hey? I thought I was losing a bit of connection, but I think it's fine now. You went a little bit frozen, but you're still there. Good eye. Um, okay, everyone's joining. So I'll, I will, I'll just keep on invite, letting everyone in. All right, sure. Um, but everyone, welcome to this amazing forest masterclass. I'm so excited. Um, this is our second last masterclass, which just blows my mind. Um, but this is a beautiful Emma Edwards from the Broke Generation. M is what she would say a ex spendaholic um now money guru um and i can attest to that because i've taken one of her classes recently and have done all of the things that she said to do and it's actually working really well for me so um i'm really excited for her to share her money manifestation and magic with you and just really beautiful practical ideas on how to be um an abundant happy person with your money um, so I'm just going to hand it over. I'm going to turn my camera off, um, but I'll still be here. And if you need me, Em, just yell out. All right, then. Okay, enjoy. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks so much for coming tonight. As Elle said, we used to work together. And since then, I've kind of gone down a bit of a um, different path and started sharing my uh, money 180 on the internet. So I, as Elle said, I used to be a bit of a spendaholic. Um, and by spendaholic, I don't mean, you know, um, that sort of really sensationalized media narrative of spendaholic where you're flying to Dubai and buying handbags and all that stuff. I was really just a bit shit with managing my money. I had a really shit relationship with money. I wasn't putting any strategies in place or doing any kind of mindset shifting to feel better about my money um, until about four or five years ago when I started to turn that around because I wanted to buy an apartment and realized that the $400 in my bank account was not going to cut it and since then I've been sharing that online with other people and my real kind of 
favorite thing to talk about is changing the way that you feel about money because the rest of it not sorts itself out but the rest of it kind of falls into place when that's kind of um when you when that all lines up in your mind it's so much easier to do all the other stuff because a lot of the time there's all this practical information out there about how to budget and which accounts to use and what you should invest in and all that stuff but I personally believe that unless your relationship with money is really sound and really positive it's not going to work so for me that's what was happening I was trying to follow all these things that I had seen and all these you know, strategies that um, Barefoot Investor and Dave Ramsey and all those things that people follow and have amazing results. But my money mindset was all over the place and my relationship with money sucked. So that's what I'm going to talk through tonight, kind of practical ways and mindset strategies that we can use to feel better about our money and kind of unpick some blocks that we might be having that might be stopping us from spreading our wings and flying. Uh, my t-shirt very appropriately says, all the honeys making money. We are the honeys and we will make some money <laughs> when we implement these strategies. So I'm just gonna go into full screen so that I can click through. Okay, great. Um, I'm sure you will all um, join me in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're all virtually joining each other tonight and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners and the custodians of the land on which I am hosting you from here in Glenira. Um, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And I've clicked off of my presentation already. So I've already done my intro in the wrong order, but my name is Emma. I'll be taking you through the session tonight. Should go for just under an hour. And if you would like to find me after the session, you can find me on Instagram at the.brokegeneration or at my blog slash website, thebrokegeneration.com. So the magic of money. I've touched on this a little bit before, but I think that ultimately as a society, we've been taught to get money all wrong, particularly as women. We kind of... We are told a lot of stories um, about the how money is not for us and the bad things about money and the negative connotations that money, sorry, I think my cat might be about to jump up, <laughs> the negative connotations that money carries when we talk about it. So people don't talk about it and we just all go around living our lives with these negative money mindsets and carrying all this kind of financial trauma and, you know, trauma that comes from other areas and bleeds into our money um, and actually when you sort all that all of that out and you um, you confront it and you start to put strategies in place to help make your money work for you money can actually be a really magical thing that can help you have freedom and confidence and less stress and do the things that you want to do and follow your passions and not be kind of tied to a desk and the patriarchy basically <laughs> So what we think money represents, we are kind of told to believe that money represents greed, capitalism, selfishness, isolation, loneliness, smugness, all those kind of stories. And, and while in many cases, these things can be true and some people are greedy and a lot of people are selfish and capitalism is real and shit. What money can actually be when you are a good person and you manage it in a way that is really aligned with your values, it can bring you abundance and freedom. It can be a beacon of feminism. It can bring you safety. It can bring you strength. It can be powerful. It can help you grow. Um, and they're the things that I really want to shift the money narrative with what I do with my content. And hopefully what we'll touch on tonight, they're how I want you to view money and how I think if you view money in this way, how I think it really produces a really different result in terms of how you position yourself to attract more money. So in terms of the manifestation of money, there's obviously the very literal sense of, you know, manifesting it in terms of visualizations and vision boards and all that stuff. And we'll touch on that a bit later, but I sort of personally think that the very foundation of manifesting more money into your life and aligning yourself with um, a life that is financially secure and financially confident and financially free is to do this groundwork that we're going to go through tonight and digging into what you're carrying with money, what's blocking you with money and actually unpacking probably things that you may not have realized about the way you view money. So money is not a dirty word, but we are taught to think that it is and thinking that it is, is what's holding us back. So a lot of the time we'll be told that it's the way that we're managing it, or it's the job that we have, or it's the relationship that we're in, or it's the things that we're buying. And while those things can have an impact, ultimately, if we hate money, 
it doesn't really matter what's going on with those things because it's going to kind of all tie back to the same negativity. Money blocks are these things that come up when we kind of really have a negative relationship with money and when we think very negatively about money, um, whether it's ours or other people's, um, and they kind of act as a wall between you and your money magic. So <clears throat> these can include being stuck in a scarcity mindset or a lack mindset. So that might be, um, you know, feeling like there isn't enough to go around or feeling like money always leaves you or feeling that you're unable to hold on to money um, or, you know, sort of um, bringing in a lot of external factors as well. So there might be things that come in for you personally that are scarce and also just your scarce view of the world in general. Um, also believing that money defines you or what you've done with money in the past defines you. Um, now I do use the term that I am a natural spender um, and I tongue in cheek use the term that I'm an ex spenderholic but that is really just to, I really use that term to define me from sort of a um, super savvy money expert that was always the budgeter, like that's why I use that term but Ultimately, I don't think that we should be defined by our past with money. I don't think that my credit card debt that I've paid off defines me. I don't think that my spending habits define me and I don't want you to either. Um, but a lot of the time we are kind of put into these boxes and that can act as a block because we kind of think, well, you know, I'm really bad with money. So money is never going to work for me or I'm never going to be able to do that because I've tried budgets in the past and I failed or I've saved money and spent it. Or maybe you've come into money in some way and you've blown it. Um, that actually happened to me when I was 15. My grandmother passed away and left me um, $20,000. Um, I spent it. Um, and again, I didn't spend it on anything particularly lavish. I just very gradually whittled it away. And for a long time, that really held me back because I felt guilt around that. And I felt that I was bad and that I had wasted it and that I was greedy and I was stupid. And I wasn't, um, I didn't have within me the ability to do anything positive with that. So it made me very scared of money. Um, and I actually found that that was kind of manifesting in that my inability to save the money I was earning was actually um, sort of subconsciously me ridding myself of money because not only did I get very temporary joy from spending it, but also if I don't have it, I can't really stuff it up. Um, and it kind of absolved me of having to learn how to manage it because I would just rid myself of it by spending. I would get a little hit of dopamine and then I would go about my life paycheck to paycheck to paycheck as, as on would we go. Um, another one can be a lack of self-worth. This was another one that really um, related to me. I used money a lot of the time, the money I did have um, that was coming in from you know jobs or whatever um I would use a lot of it to try and improve myself or fix myself or impress other people um and even though that's you know buying clothes or makeup or event tickets or whatever it might be to kind of try and create a persona that you think people want um while on the surface that might seem kind of innocent enough it actually kind of becomes a bit of a manifesto for you and your relationship with money um so that might be something that comes up for you as well and also a fear mindset so that can come from either existing trauma that you've already had or maybe um just a uh, worries and fears and stresses about the future and how money relates to that so it could be maybe you um have had relationship problems in the past and you're perhaps held back with money because you're constantly worried about looking after yourself and making sure that you're okay on your own so you can't actually lean into sharing money with a partner or it might be um illness or injury or redundancy those things that you might be fearful of whether or not they've happened before or not they can hold you back because you kind of think, well, I'm never going to get anywhere because I'm worried that those things are going to happen. So all of those money blocks and all those negativity things. And again, the media sensationalization comes into, that was a really long word, sense it. The media sensationalizes this type of thing um, because they really love stories about people that have, you know, um, been made redundant and broken their leg and lost all their money or those types of stories we are told very often and we're taught to be very fearful of these things and the financial aspect of those things what we're not taught is that if we get on top of our money heal our relationship with money and feel good about money we can actually see money as a vehicle to prevent those terrible things from happening um, or soften the blow if we do run into those types of um, life events and it all comes down to your relationship with money and your money story. So your relationship with money is formed at a very early age. It begins to form at an early age. Um, and 
it continues to develop over time. So while a lot of the early foundations um, will come from what money meant to you as a child or how you saw money being used in the home or how your parents believed, um, what your parents believed about money, they may have imparted that onto you um, either directly or indirectly. And then it kind of begins to shape as we get our own money, whether that's pocket money or whether it's money that we earn from a job. And then the things that we do with money and the result of that as we get a little bit older. So a lot of money story conversation kind of only really talks about that early phase, but I definitely think that mine has evolved as I've got older, I'm nearly 30. And I think the things particularly that I did when I first had my own money kind of actually painted another layer on top of that um that yes indeed were probably formed by those earlier stages um but then it really kind of put it in the context of my life um by it being my own money rather than money that I was seeing around me um the way that that manifests in your day-to-day -day money management is what will form your kind of your money journey and your money story going forward so the key pillars that form your relationship with money, again, are early memories and your own financial past. So those are the two things I've talked about just then. Um, as an example, my, um, sorry, I'm just moving the <laughs> cameras around. Um, my parents got divorced when I was 11 and that really impacted my money mindset in terms of having money and losing it. So we were never wealthy, but obviously two incomes is often better than one so we went from being a double income family to a single income family I was raised by my mum obviously women tend to get paid less they do caring jobs they do jobs that work around school and that kind of thing so we went from being like moderately comfortable to not very good at all and that's always been a huge fear for me and that's played massively into my money story and I've really noticed it manifesting at times when I've you know started to try and buy property um, or invest in shares my risk aversion is very very high um, so well my risk aversion is high I have a low appetite for risk um, whereas looking at my partner who had a very happy upbringing um, and a very safe one financially and otherwise um, does not have that same risk aversion because it's not his relationship with money is not tied to those past traumas um, another one is emotional triggers and this kind of manifests in sort of emotional spending. So again, for me, it was that um, self-esteem, self-worth um, piece, but it can also be however you attach money onto other things that are happening in your life. So do you spend money when you're stressed? Do you spend money when you're upset? Do you spend money, um, you know, when you're getting over a breakup? Do you spend money um, when you're bored? All those types of triggers that can actually layer on how you spend your money or do or don't keep your money. And then the role that money has played for you throughout your life. So has money been a source of pain and trauma for you or has it been something that's been really great for you? Have you used money? Again, this kind of comes back to the comparison between my partner and I. My partner has used money to travel the world, to take time off of uni, to work part-time for a period of time whereas I've often used money to sort of pay my I mean again this is my mindset but pay my visa fee I give some money to my mum sometimes I feel like I've had to have a bit more of a um, awareness of the negative side of money or the sort of um, a bit more transactional side of money rather than getting as much joy from my money as somebody else may have so whatever that kind of looks like for you can actually be informing the way that you're feeling about money on a day to day basis and the way that you are spending it as well. So what does a negative relationship with money look like in the real world? So if these things are happening for you, what's what does that actually look like in, in the day to day of managing your money? It can look like getting stuck in a debt cycle. It can look like forever wondering where your money went. It can look like spending to cheer yourself up big one for me it can look like never letting yourself feel worthy of nice things um that is a caveat I should mention a lot of my um personal experience is in overspending whereas actually for a lot of people there's an underspending narrative that is equally problematic but in a completely different way so a lot of people won't spend and you may relate to this that you feel like you can't spend um or you can't um, allow yourself to enjoy money because you perhaps have high risk aversion as well, low risk tolerance as well, um, and you actually feel like you need to hoard money or hold on to money, um, which can be really, um, really problematic in terms of as you get older and growing your money and setting yourself up for the future. Um, assuming that you'll always be stuck where you are, struggling to hold on to money or struggling to save money, and then worrying about money when you don't have to. 
And this is one that I've started to realize I have um, often when we don't have any money or we are on a low income, we think that having money will solve everything. But actually, um, often having it, the fears still remain. And I think that's a testament to how important your money mindset is, because actually it's not about the money. There are often other things going on there. And I always say to people when I have them look at their transactions, I say, um, yes, the amounts that are coming out is important, but it's also important to look at what's coming up behind those transactions. Why did you spend that? Is it really just $10 at Woolies or is it $10 at Woolies that you spent because you were feeling a certain way? Um, is it $100 to debt that is, you know, you paying off something that was necessary? Or is it something that you've been sort of a bit sucked into perhaps by afterpay or those types of things that are really designed to tap into your negative emotion cycle? So to combat these things, what we really need to do is confront those things that are coming up for you. Obviously, when I'm saying these things out, <clears throat> you'll have some, um, you'll probably have some responses of your own that are coming up and start to piece together that money story of yours. Um, and from there, we need to open ourselves up to money and find ways to feel wealthier um, because that can start to, often it feels a bit uncomfortable, but when we start to do those things, it can actually start to override that narrative that we've kind of started to form throughout our lives. And feeling abundant and wealthy has very little to do with what's in your bank account. Um, I've started to learn this very recently. And <clears throat> while I don't want to kind of, you know, that is a very sweeping statement. Yes, there are people living in poverty and that very much relates. But what I mean really is um, I've gone from earning like $30,000 a year to $80,000 a year. And actually the tools that I do to make myself feel wealthy can actually be scaled um, to, to fit with both of those types of incomes. And neither of them are ridiculously high either, but I still have learned to spend in a way that makes me feel really abundant and like I have enough, um, which is a really important thing to lean into. <clears throat> so step one, confront your money story that we've gone through and anything that's come up for you and see if you can come up with any associated money blocks from that and just visualize wiping the slate clean. And then from there, instead of using your learnings as negative biases, as often this is what we do when I've said about letting money define us, we might sort of come up and say, oh, well, my parents got divorced when I was 11, so I'm really risk averse and I'll never buy property. Rather than using them for that, use them as positive springboards to a better money mindset. So you might, however you kind of connect, maybe you journal um, or speak to, you know, speak it out loud or um, fill in, you know, whatever you do for your sort of um, mindfulness practices. Um, try for each thing that comes up, each block, break down what the negative bias might be and then see if you can come up with a positive one. So for me, what that looks like, um, going back to being risk averse for property, even though it's um, going to be harder for me to buy property because I am more risk averse, what it does do is it allows me to think a lot more critically and think a lot more, um, I personally would say realistically, about the future of owning property with a partner, whereas somebody who hasn't had that experience may not actually consider the nuances of what it would look like if you got divorced. Have you got wills? Have you, you know, um, thought about, you know, whose super is where and those types of things. So I now see that as a positive thing, whereas previously it's been a negative thing for me. So just flipping that, um, flipping those findings to be something positive because there is a learning in everything that you've been through. Um, trying to find a positive um, spin on it is, is a great step forward. Um, and then start feeling more abundant and wealthy by using techniques that actively respond and retaliate to those money blocks. So I've got a few little ways here. Um, these are kind of my like how to feel wealthier without earning or really spending any more money. Um, and for me, I found that one really easy way to find to, for me to feel really much more wealthier is to um, is to give more, but not even necessarily financially. If you want to give to charities or to shout the drinks when you're out with friends, that's great. But also another way of doing it is, um, you might relate to this. I found that because of scarcity that I was holding on to from when I was on that $30,000 a year income, every time I want to get rid of something from the house, clothes, shoes, an old TV, whatever it is, I put myself through the trauma of Facebook marketplace every time. And I hate face. I think Facebook Marketplace is great, but as a seller, I just find it really, really stressful. And you're bartering with somebody who doesn't show up for like five dollars, 
And what I realized is I could just give that stuff either to people I know or to the op shop. And often it feels weird when you're giving stuff away that you know you can actually get money for. But I actually find that when I give those things away, I'm saving myself time and energy and stress and I'm giving something away that I know is going to bring somebody else loads of joy when they find it in the op shop. And it's a Camilla Remark dress that I wore once because I got too chunky for it. Um, so I think that starting to do those little things um, really start to break. It's a really easy one to break down the barriers and it can be really small, even if it's giving $5 to the next homeless person that you see. It's something that I often do and it's like an energy exchange for me. Um, another one is surround yourself with money. I read about this in a book um, several years ago and I now keep cash in several areas of my house. Um, <laughs> I won't tell you where I live or how much, um, but I just took some cash out of the bank one day and I've got like a little bit in a money box and a little bit in a wallet and a little bit by the door. And just the idea was that you are, you can kind of look at it two ways. If you're pretty into the woo woo, you can look at it in terms of, you know, surrounding yourself with money and attracting it and being a money magnet, but also um, in a more practical sense, it's actually just feels really nice to have cash right there you know when someone's coming over or you are buying something on marketplace or someone's dropping something off or you want to tip somebody and you think i've got to go to the atm and the minimum i can get is 20 it just felt really good to have cash there and sometimes i'll just reach for that if i need it for something um it just kind of took that barrier away from me having to go to the atm and it just feels good to know that there is cash there um especially if your cards get blocked and all that kind of stuff it's a log logistical bonus as well um, energy and universe shopping, you may have heard of this before. Um, there's a few different ways that you can do it, but a lot of it comes down to uh, either physically going to stores and visualizing yourself living a life that you want to live and buy, buying the things that you want to buy. So it might be you go around the fancy part of Chaston and you surround yourself with um, a designer that you really like. Maybe you're really into Louis Vuitton bags or something like that. You go there and you actually have a really abundant day. You obviously don't have to actually buy it, but you kind of go and visualize the energy exchange of you, of you acquiring those things and visualize the person that you would be if that became a reality for you. Um, another way is sort of maybe better for if we were in lockdown or whatever, um, you can sort of visualize getting, I think they're called energy checks from the universe that a lot of people use. And you imagine that you're given a large amount of money for the universe every day and you have to actually spend all of it. Elle's holding something up. <laughs> I've, I have printed out three. You've got some. Yeah, and I've got one to put on my new uh, vision board and I have one for $10 million in my wallet. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, Jim Carrey did $10,000 in his wallet and that's when he got signed for the mask. Yes, I've read this. Um, so I have done this on and off over the years and it actually works. Like I had one, I think it was $3,666 and I got a gig for 3700 or something. No, that's cool. Check from the universe. Yeah, I've done it that way, as in manifesting the money coming in. I haven't, well, I've only recently started doing it this way where you mentally spend it too. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's quite interesting to not let yourself save it because if someone's like, what would you do if I gave you 10 grand? Everyone's like, well, I'd put two grand in savings <laughs> and then because you just would. But because it's not real money, the point is you have to spend it all. And I found that quite interesting. Yeah, or you, yeah, put like a hundred dollar note in your wallet and you walk around and think about all the things that you could buy with that over and over and over again so that's yeah yeah, yeah. all right I'll shut up now <laughs> <laughs> but yeah lots of different ways that you can do this energy universe shopping in a kind of the way that relates best to you I would say um don't save things for best this was something I always did and because of my uh <laughs> lifelong battle with fluctuating weight it often meant that best never came because by the time best came um I'd grown out of it or shrunk out of it um, in terms of saving clothes for best that would be an example um, and I now just don't do that um, and I realized that the reason I was doing that was because I would worry that I would spill something on it break it lose it whatever and therefore I wouldn't be able to get it again because I wouldn't have the financial capacity to do that whereas what I've started realizing is more often than not I mean I don't wear like Valentino clothes or whatever so more often than not if I spill something on the silk top at least I'll have got some wear out of it and I can either pay to get it cleaned professionally or I can actually rebuy it if I really love it and that was really something that I realized I wasn't allowing myself to believe 
um, another kind of example of that is sort of like, I used to be perpetually terrified of getting a parking ticket um, because I would just find paying $130 or whatever it was, nobody wants a parking ticket, but I would find the concept of buying it. I would really believe that I just couldn't afford it. I'd be thinking, well, I can't get a parking ticket because I can't afford it. Yeah, I'm trotting off to the movies at 50 bucks a ticket at gold class. So I definitely can, but I think that the barrier was me thinking that I had these limits of things, oh, well, I can't afford that and I can afford that. And really separating that, a lot of that ties into the not saving things for best. Um, and that was kind of quite life-changing for me. Um, another one is don't always opt for the cheapest. Um, again, a lot of us will hang on to that from times in our lives and we've earned less money. Um, and we'll kind of think, well, I've got to get the own brand mayonnaise or I must, um, we did this a lot because obviously I'm from the UK, if you can't tell from my <laughs> bizarre hybrid accent. Um, and my partner and I had realized that we would always look for flights and just pick the cheapest one. Doesn't matter if it had a 75 hour layover, doesn't matter if it was like five stopovers, we'd book the cheapest flight because we used to be broke students and that's what we had to do. Whereas then we started to realize we could actually use literally $200 more and have a much more pleasant experience. And once we let go of that obsessing over having to have the cheapest, because it was something that we couldn't afford, even though we actually could, um, that really broke down a lot of barriers in terms of using money as a vehicle to have a, for me, a, a comfortable life. I'm often pay for convenience and people say that you shouldn't, but for me, that's something I value. Um, so yeah, that was a really long winded way of saying don't always opt for the cheapest. And um, another one is minimize payments. So I personally really like to pay things annually as an example, because I'm actually paying out for boring stuff less often. I also like to do stock up shops on things like toothpaste and washing up liquid and toilet paper or get it on subscription if I can. Because for me, it's something that makes me feel really scarce and like I'm sort of in a negative space about money is exchanging my money and therefore time for those boring things. So I just engage with doing that much less. I would rather shop four times a year for all those essentials, stock up and feel like I'm a complete adulting hero because every time a toothpaste runs out, I've got one in stock. Nothing feels better, trust me. Um, but also I'm engaging with that type of spending way less. And it also stops me popping out to get toothpaste and coming home with like armfuls of cheesels or whatever. So it kind of saves you money in a really literal sense, but in a um, mindset sense, distancing yourself from payments you don't like making um, is really helpful even for things like if you don't like paying for the dentist or you don't like paying for petrol um, I'll often just kind of almost pay it up front so put it into a savings account so that that's already paid for so that when I go to the dentist I don't actually have to technically pay because I've already allocated the money elsewhere um, so I'm distancing myself from that negativity I feel with spending that um, there's a million other ways as well but they're just sort of some starters. So <clears throat> connecting to your money and letting it flow, uh, realizing that money is something that flows um, was quite instrumental for changing my money mindset. And also sometimes I kind of like to mentally zoom out and kind of realize that there is actually an amount of money in the world and it's all the same money that is going around. Um, I feel like that for some reason helps me visualize it a lot better. Um, but yeah, money that comes into you has come from somewhere else and then you give it and it comes back. And <clears throat> what we're gonna dig into in this section is kind of connecting to that and feeling like money is, you're, you're connected in a way, but you're also disconnected in a way that you're not sort of um, tying it to these arbitrary things. You're just allowing it to flow to you. So they say give out good and you get back good in an energetic kind of mood sense, but the same goes for your money. If you give positively, if you spend positively, whether that's tangibly or energetically, you're actually engaging with the flow of money in and out. So a bit like when we were saying, if you feel really ugh about paying out for the dentist, um, that's kind of a negative giving of money. You're, you're releasing money very negatively. Whereas if you're focused on releasing it positively, um, either by distancing yourself so you don't have that negative feeling or by shit, blah, blah, or by reframing your, your expenditure in a positive way. So sort of seeing as I'm investing in my health or we've got a few examples on the next slide, um, but really shifting it into a positive way rather than a negative way. So that if you're positively, you're more likely to have the money come back to you because you've engaged with it in a positive way. So when you spend out money, you open your awareness to how that money can come back to you 
by seeing it as a flowing cycle and then paying extra attention to when you're spending out on yourself. So I think often, particularly as women, we don't like to invest in ourselves in anything deeper than a superficial level that society tells us we need to. So we sort of think of, you know, buying haircuts or clothes or whatever it might be. But when we're actually investing in ourselves on a higher level, it can feel even ickier because we're not used to doing that. So pay extra attention to if you're spending out in that way because there's a good chance that breaking down barriers there can actually help you see how that may bring more money back to you whether you're investing in sort of a course like this for example um, or if you have businesses or jobs any kind of professional development um, rather than seeing it as something that you're paying out you're seeing it as I'm paying out $500 to become the type of person that can bring in whatever amount is in your head for you and by coming back to reframing your expenditures to be abundant minded rather than scarcity minded and I've got some examples of that here so a bit like the dentist example instead of saying oh I have to spend a hundred dollars on food for the week think that you get to spend a hundred dollars on food for the week and you can buy foods that you really like and this is why I really like have, have given up you know, trying to buy all those miserable foods that they tell are really healthy for you. I would rather spend it on food I like because that makes it something positive for me. Um, I just got paid and now I have to pay my electricity bill rather than seeing it as a, oh, I had the money and now it's gone. You can be thankful that you've been paid and that covers your bills because for a lot of people that isn't true. And really being grateful for that comfortable um, feeling of being able to pay your bills with money that's been paid to you for your job. Um, I'm only saving $100 this month. I'll never get anywhere at this rate. A lot of that stuff is very, especially when we are on low incomes or if you've got kids or other things going on or businesses, um, often small amounts where kind of, again, media sensationalizes huge progress. This woman saved $35,000 in one year. Um, whereas if you can actually get grateful for that $100 and actually see it as contributing to progress um, and that you get to save that $100 for the future as well as living in the now, you're kind of reframing that into a much more positive narrative around your expenses. So how to live in alignment with money magic. Um, as much as I adore money mindset and breaking down your money blocks, obviously you do need to follow it through with practical strategies. And neither one can really exist without the other in terms of money magic. So you can have a great money mindset, but if you're not following through with practical strategies, it's gonna fall flat. Likewise, if you're really good at the practical strategies, but there's all mess going on behind the scenes, again, it's not gonna line up for that money magic. So the money magic really lies at that intersection where you're feeling good about money and you are putting the practical steps in place so that your money does go to the right place. It's no good feeling really good about money, but still spending it all and wondering why you're not getting anywhere with your investing. <clears throat> so <clears throat> positive money mindsets and practical follow throughs. So examples of your positive money mindset, gratitude for the things that you have over yearning for things that you don't reframing your thoughts as we've just talked about from an I can't afford that to a more positive I don't save I don't place value on that right now or I'm going to save for that so rather than seeing the things that you can't afford finding a way that you can um, seeing your money is energy that can be directed towards the things that you value feeling deserving and worthy of money feeling positive Feelings of positivity towards those with money. So again, like I said at the beginning, a lot of what we think about money is associated to the hyper wealthy. Um, and it can make us feel almost like, oh, well, I don't want that because I don't want to become that person. But again, we're blaming the money. Whereas actually, if you're a good person, which I'm 100% confident you all are, <laughs> you don't need to, it's not that money does that to you. And that's what we've kind of bought into that money is this negative thing. And if you have it, you're a terrible person. Whereas actually, if you have it intentionally and positively, um, you can do really good things with it for yourself and for things that you care about. And then the practical follow through is allowing yourself to spend out on things that bring you joy, um, setting a budget and sticking to it. So obviously if your money comes in, you need to have a bit spare if you want to grow up for the future. Um, checking in with your money regularly and tracking your progress. Again, being really actually connected to the money without necessarily needing to be a spreadsheet obsessive. Um, checking in regularly and actually looking at your money because you're never going to know what's happening if you're not looking at it allocating money to future you, whether that is through savings, investments, or super. Um, not blowing all your money is a way to uh, self-sabotage after one little mistake. I'm sure we've all done it with food when you've had 
one muffin from the work tray and suddenly you're ordering Uber Eats for dinner and you've had six more donuts on the way home. Same goes with money. If you've decided to spend a certain amount and you've overspent, doesn't mean that every dollar after that doesn't count. It does all count. So cancelling the self-sabotage, being really aware of it and making sure you're not leaving money on the table. Um, so a lot of the time, especially if you have businesses or if you're negotiating pay rises or anything like that, um, often will, especially again as women, all comes back to being women half the time, we will settle. We're taught to settle for something that's good enough um, rather than saying, well, actually, how about I was actually would have quoted X, Y, and Z or not leaving money on the table in terms of little things like not going to get that refund because you can't be bothered. So something sits and collects dust in the corner of your laundry room when actually you've left a hundred bucks on the table. Um, those kind of things all tie back into your practical follow through. In terms of tools that can help you do this, um, in the money management side, in the money, sorry, in the money mindset side, there's obviously things like vision boarding, having affirmations and intentions, which we will talk about next. Um, there are money meditations that you can do. Um, money journaling is a really good one. I really like to journal about sort of um, things that I will one day be able to do if I stick to my sort of spending plan or budget or whatever you want to call it. Um, those things help me get really connected. And then visualization kind of ties into vision boarding for me personally, because it helps me um, actually think about what I really want. Um, I think another thing that we struggle with is that we're told to want all these things, but we don't really think about whether we actually want them. And that's what can make having financial confidence feel really out of reach because there's all these things that we're supposed to want. We're supposed to want a house and travel and a big family and all these types of things and send your kids to good schools when actually you may not really want any of those things. So when you really drill down into what your priorities are, it can feel a lot more achievable to get to that point because you're not shooting for all these things that everybody else is shooting for. You're only shooting for the things that actually align with what you want. Um, and that really make, made that state of financial confidence seem so much more achievable to me. And making it achievable is something that is a really important barrier to break down because so often we are told that we won't get to a certain place because we are female, because of the color of our skin, because of what we do for a living. We will be told these things that um, relate to our money potential. So um, doing what you can to connect to your potential and see that it is possible. Um, practical tools. Um, I My favorite thing, I think I invented it anyway. <laughs> I don't know if anyone had it before me, but I came up with it myself, is the joy budget. So a little bit like Marie Kondo says, going through your house and seeing if things bring you joy. When you review your spending transactions each month or week or quarter, however, however often you do it, I always recommend that people go through and rank every transaction that isn't essential out of 10 on a joy scale so that you can see whether you're actually spending your money in a way that's in alignment with you. So if you kind of think, yeah, my money manage my money mindset's great. I'm spending my money really well. And then you do this exercise and actually you've all got three, four and five in your joy budget. You're not actually allocating your money to things that are bringing you joy. So you're probably not going to feel sustained long-term. Whereas whether you're spending $100 or $1,000, if it's all on things that are eights, nines and tens on the joy scale, you're really going to feel like that money is working for you. However much you've given yourself or however much you earn, you can actually feel like you're getting value out of that. Um, regular money self dates. Again, this may be where you do your joy budget, but again, it's coming back to that connecting to your money and making sure that you're aware of what's happening in your accounts and how what might be going on behind the scenes with your mental health or your money mindset is manifesting in where your money is actually going. Um, having a splurge fund, my favorite thing, um, it all comes back to that permission and creating possibility. So having all your money tied away in like a high interest savings account is great on paper because all of your money is getting the most interest it can. But if you're the type of person that's going to be like, oh, no, I won't get that because I don't want to, you've got maybe you've got an even 10,000 in there and you don't want to break it. If that's something that you might relate to. Um, having a bit in that splurge fund does give you that permission to actually use it to get things that you want. Um, another one is never hitting zero. This is a really fun um, abundance tool that I like to use rather than ever letting your accounts get to zero, set like a new zero. So maybe you put $500 in and you just treat that as your zero. Um, it's quite good from a 
logistical perspective because one you can never go overdrawn because your overdraft is your own money technically um but also it is a really good from a mindset perspective because it really helps with that feeling of enough because even if you if life happens and you do get disorganized and you do forget to make a payment or something it's going to come out and it's never going to go to zero and you're never going to kind of be in that scarcity state of getting the overdrawn notification and trying to get the money in before midnight so you don't get the fee um and that's been a really um a really good one for me and it just kind of helps me feel a bit like money a bit like surrounding myself with the money it feels like the money is there and I'm not going to run out of it um and then extra sources of income um I'm a bit of a side hustler um I have my income comes from multiple different sources and that's has been instrumental for changing my money mindset just because it really um, helps with the abundance. And whether that is having a side business or a fully fledged business, or it's um, having you know some way that you, I and mean, whether it is, um, <coughs> whether it's Uber driving or um, bringing in um, money from doing garage sales or helping a friend with a business on the weekends or doing, I think some people like to do surveys and stuff online, which I did when I was a bit younger. Um, any kind of way that you can find ways to bring in money, however small, can feel really abundant and make you feel in control of your financial situation. <clears throat> and we'll finish off with some money intentions and affirmations. Um, they're like goals, but better in my opinion. So money intentions are not the same as money goals. Um, a goal, and I do think you should have goals for sure. Money goals are specific and they relate to arriving at a specific point or achieving a certain amount. So saving $10,000 in an emergency fund or um, paying off debt or whatever. An intention is more about having an attitude or a feeling. And I think this is really important because it helps you connect to how you actually want to feel about money, um, which can in turn unlock how you're currently not feeling. Um, <clears throat> So you might want to ask yourself, how do you want money to make you feel? And how do you want to feel about money? Um, and they seem very similar, but they are actually very different questions. So you might want money to make you feel wealthy and abundant and free and confident, but you might want to feel about money. You might want to feel less stressed. You might want to rid yourself of that worry. You might want to feel in control. Um, some answers from those questions will probably start to come up and help you um, form your intentions. For me, again, it really comes back to like confidence, um, confidence and the freedom to, I mean, <laughs> coronavirus aside, to um, be able to get back to the UK whenever I want or need to has always been a big thing for me. That's something I've always shot for in my um, financial endeavours. I've always wanted to have the money there. And my, my long term goal with money is to be in a position where I do have that freedom um, to go back to the UK or, you know, anywhere really um, on my own terms without having to feel really scarce about it. So some, ex oops, some examples might be, you'll, I will become financially prepared for emergencies so I don't have to worry about paying bills. I'll be able to travel when I want to and lean into my abundance, or I will provide my family and give them a comfortable life free from money worries. So whatever is coming up for you will start to inform those things, but obviously making sure that it's, not, it's very easy to slip into a goal by accident. Um, but if, it's some, if you're thinking, oh, I wanna pay off my debt, think about why you want to pay off your debt. Um, if you're thinking about, oh, I want to have the freedom to travel, why is that? Um, is that because you want to um, work less? Is it because you want to, um, phys physically, physical traveling and seeing the world is on your kind of list of must haves? Um, lean into the reasons behind those. Um, and finally, affirmations and money mantras, they help you hone the belief that you can earn, keep and grow your money. So whether you write them down, whether you say them out loud, I personally like to record them on my phone and listen to them in my headphones each morning when I'm on the train, except when you forget to connect your Bluetooth headphones and they start blasting out to everyone, it's a little embarrassing. So make sure you don't make that same mistake. Um, I have blocked my own screen, so I need to move you around. Um, some examples are money flows to me easily. Uh, when I spend money, it comes back to me stronger and greater. I have the skills, knowledge and abilities to always bring in the money I need to my life. I'm worthy of financial freedom and abundance of money surrounds me. 
the money is coming I really like that one um kind of helps me when I'm feeling a bit when you've had those months where like no money's come in and you're like what's happening um if the money isn't here yet it's on its way I'm thankful for money and what it brings me and I accept and receive money there are loads online if those aren't connecting with you um and a lot of people share them on Instagram as well so keep your eyes peeled for those and that is my final slide. That was a bit of an abrupt end. Sorry, <laughs> I probably should have wound it down a little bit more. Um, but that is, I will shop, stop sharing and we can chat if anyone would like to. <laughs> Bang on 49 minutes. I hope you enjoyed um, and I hope you're feeling a little more positive about money. Ask away, babes. Do people type or, to, or talk questions? We talk. I just. Oh. <laughs> How nice. Hi, Harry. I was hoping, Emma, your cat was going to jump up and say hi, it but. He does. Didn't. Um, we got a new litter box today, so he's a bit on edge. <laughs> <laughs> As I probably would be too. If I was. Classic <laughs> cats. They're so weird. Harry looks so angry. <laughs> so any insights guys like anything what what is what things have you learned through that what hi em. hi <laughs> hi emma thanks so much um <laughs> i learned a lot i actually bought your um guide a while ago and I've been working my way through it because I found you on Instagram so seeing that Elle was bringing you along to the forest was um really exciting but uh what struck me was that well what you were saying about women and money mm. and it made me really realize a lot of my own money blocks are around like I don't deserve it um I'm I'm always in this lack mindset so that was really interesting and I was made redundant and I do have a new zero now in my mind, in my, you know, my account. That's interesting that you said that. But, yeah, I was like, wow, I really tie a lot of my money to my emotion and I do a lot of that emotional spending. So that was really good, something for me to think about. So, yeah, thanks so much. That was really good. Oh, I'm so glad. I think um, the, the female stuff is really starting to, especially when you look at the way that brands get you to spend more money with advertising and, like, bumping you through the sales funnel and stuff, like, it's all female stuff because they know Definitely. we'll take the bait because they've told us to. And like, there's a whole economic theory called the lipstick effect that when yes. we're sessions, women buy lipstick and it's like, why aren't you looking at what the men are buying? <laughs> why are they yeah. I always even do that thing. And I think we all do it. It'll be like, say buying something on Amazon or even buying something through the skincare that I use can only get free postage if I spend $50. So instead of just spending the $20 and paying the 10 postage, I'll be like, well, I should really spend $50. <laughs> yeah. I really noticed that um, Zoe Foster Blake's skincare brand, Go To, is really sneaky with that. They're That's shit what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> We're shipping 65 bucks and everything's $59. So yeah. you literally double your spend to get it free. Oh, it makes me so angry. <laughs> frustrating because it's a lot it's not it's not exactly a cheap product so yeah exactly it's all, yeah. There isn't, yeah yeah thank you so much though really insightful I've learned quite a lot so thank you I'm glad you enjoyed hi Emma hi, hi everybody <laughs> um this was really good because I have this like I'm sure a lot of us have like these conflicting things in our mind when it comes to money, like we want it and we deserve it. But at the same time, like money makes me really angry. <laughs> and like, I don't want to have to use money. Like I don't want to live in a society where we have to use money. I want, I don't like that. But at the same time, like this is the reality that we live in. So you said something that was something like, well, if I don't have it, then I can't mess it up. And that's kind of like how I've always spent money. Like, well, whatever, like I'll just, get what I want now because who knows if I'll have money later and I might as well have what I want right now. Like why wait? So it's kind of like this messed up way of like what you were talking about, like don't wait to have the best or whatever. Like I'm very much like, if you want it, get it now. <laughs> but 
it's not like always maybe the best choice that's going to serve what I want in the long run. And so it's hard for me to kind of navigate that balance. And it's, it's, this is probably like the first time I've ever heard somebody talk about money and talk about like, well, how does it make you feel? Because every time we're talking about money with somebody, they're like, well, here's how you budget. So you want to like budget every cent and like use the spreadsheet or use these envelopes or use whatever, like have multiple streams of income because one, and, and obviously like some of the th stuff is good. It's good stuff, like you said, but it's never like, but why do you feel the way you feel about money? Which is really helpful for me to start thinking about because when you were talking, I was like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. maybe I do feel like. I, I know I have like a scarcity mindset when it comes to money because of how I grew up. And so to think about like balancing how I feel kind of spiritually with how I've been raised financially is really interesting. So it's a lot to think about. It's really good. I appreciate it. Good. I'm glad it was, um, I'm glad it got you thinking about that. And I, I totally relate to the dissonance as well between kind of hating capitalism and feeling bad for wanting money because you're like why do we even have to have it but then also there's that there's that kind of guilt is a useless emotion because if we don't have it we're not solving anything so we might as well have it and do something good with it um than not have it but it there is still dis the dissonance is still really real and also what you're saying about um thinking about how your money makes you feel I think that that's what's been missing for so long from money stuff for women and that's why it hasn't connected because I remember when I started doing what I'm doing someone said to me a man obviously why are you even doing this because um ASIC money smart already has all of this information and I'm like yeah I'm not saying I've made this stuff up myself I'm confident that it's out there but it doesn't connect with women and I think it's because to me the tools that don't talk about how you feel about money are like when people tell you to relax when you're stressed you're kind of like, cool, thanks. Now I'm fixed now. Like it's all very well to set a budget, but it's not working because I haven't worked out what's going on beneath the surface. And I think because women are more emotional and we are <laughs> better people, <laughs> we are, we do care more and we do think about what people think about us more. And we do um, think about, we have empathy and we do think about what we do, how it impacts other people. I think that that really holds us back with money and it keeps us really small um, when actually we should be taking it for ourselves and doing good things with it so I'm really glad you connected with that I really resonate Lisa with what you said there it's kind of um it's really interesting and everything you said Emma is so thought-provoking um because I guess I've always attached negative like the negative and toxic relationship with money as people hoarding it and like like not willing to spend it on things um and I've always been very comfortable with spending money like but to the detriment because I am a, a fucking terrible saver <laughs> um and yeah so it's like I've been going through that actually a little bit lately of like how do I how do I keep making myself happy with the things I'm spending my money on because I am I'm spending money on things that are genuinely um bringing me joy and you know, making me feel um, like I know that like it's it's aligned with my soul and what I need to be doing, but it like it's that getting that balance right of well, why does it like how do you break that cycle now of trying to pay off your debt, living paycheck to paycheck, um, and just like getting out of that? I don't know. It's 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 so complicated. It is so complex and complicated and kind of scary um to look at how how do we go how do we break it so I said there needs to be a circuit breaker to get to just get back mm. get that control that sense of control back because I always felt like I was in control because I was I was comfortable with spending my money right I wasn't like I know that the money's going to come back in I'm going to get paid again the bills all get paid but but then it's like well hang on a minute I need to get the control back that was a long-winded thing, but yeah. No, I totally agree. And spending cycles, I think, are really, even if they are quite healthy, it is still, and 
regardless of whether you've got a good or bad money mindset, we all get dopamine when we buy things. And that's how we get into that cycle because it's just the same as getting a hit of anything else. The more recently you did it, the more you're going to want it. Um, so for me, and I, I think as well, it's kind of accepting that it's not something that you fix once and then you're done. Like you may get out of the cycle and then something happens and you get back into it and you get back into it. And it's quite, a, it's quite hard to swallow because you kind of think, oh God, I did all this work and now I'm back in the cycle maybe. Um, I really got back into it in lockdown. I'd obviously done so well with my shopping and then lockdown came and I was like, parcels every week to feel better. <laughs> um, but I think it's once you have the tools there and once you know um, how what that circuit breaker might look like for you or and the impact of doing that, um, and also learning how to adjust what you're doing for your goals at that time. Um, so sometimes you might spend a lot because um, because saving isn't on your radar at that point, and that's fine. And again, I think leaning into what's really important to you, because again, kind of emotionless money content would be like, no, you always must be saving. Whereas if saving is not a goal for you at this point, and you're really investing in yourself, then maybe you are living paycheck to paycheck in inverted commas, when actually... Um, it's just a case of knowing how to like rebalance the scales. If you do get to a point where you want to aggressively save, you actually know what to do to have that circuit breaker. My throat is sore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any other questions? It's super interesting. Thank you, Emma. Well, em, I just think that what you're doing is inspiring and I'm just so proud of you from, because I've seen the transformation. Yeah, so, do you remember when I started? <laughs> yes, I remember when you had that account and it just, you know, I remember when you first had the account, I think like, you know, me and Ruby Assembly and Jess probably were the first people that follow, you know, follow that group of people that followed and you know, you're just, you know, doing incredible things and teaching p predominantly women how to really empower themselves and take control of their money. So thank you so much for, for playing with us in the forest. <laughs> and and um, I, will, I will get this call into the space and I'll send you the link too um, so you can have, have it. And, yeah, like if there's any other questions that pop up in the comments underneath for people watching the replay do you mind if I send them to you yeah of course yeah cool yeah. awesome thank you so much <laughs> and um I'll see all you babes on Wednesday hopefully thank you Emma thank you Elle thank you everyone Bye. thank you Sometimes. <laughs> See you, Alicia. <laughs> Are you trying to stay? I'm just muting. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Oh,